Good morning, or actually afternoon as of two minutes ago, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pleased to be joined uh, today from Baghdad Live by Colonel John Dorian. Uh, JD, we want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. I've got you loud and clear, Jeff. Without any uh, further hesitation or ado, we will hand it over to you for your opening comments. Very good. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. I've seen a lot of discussion in recent days uh, about plans for isolating and liberating Raqqa, and I thought it would be appropriate to spend a few minutes on where we are now, the impact of past operations, and what we're going to do to set conditions for the liberation of Raqqa. In Syria, Operation Noble Lance, the operation with Turkey and their partnered forces, has liberated approximately 50 villages to date, further isolating pockets of Daesh uh, uh, presence, including Raqqa. Um, before, excuse me, <laughs> further uh, isolating uh, the areas uh, in the northern, uh, in the north of Syria uh, surrounding Raqqa. Before Noble Lance, Turkey and their partner forces con conducted Operation Euphrates Shield, liberating Jurabalus and a number of villages along the border. Those operations built a significant buffer along Syria's northern border, making it much more difficult for Daesh to infiltrate across the border into Europe. Before that operation, our partner force, the Syrian Democratic Forces, liberated Manbij after fierce resistance from Daesh. The enemy fought hard to retain this territory, which they'd used as a command and control node for external operations, leveraging its strategic location along the border. Ultimately, Daesh were forced to retreat and used human shields they were driven from the city. Those operations have already done quite a bit to isolate Raqqa, reducing the access to infiltration routes to and from Europe. Throughout these operations, which were designed to increase pressure on the enemy, coalition forces have continued to relentlessly attack Daesh leadership figures, decimating Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's Shuro Council, and extended leadership network. We've also continuously attacked their ability to make money in both Iraq and Syria from illicit sales of petroleum products, and we've used strikes to destroy their favored supply and infiltration runs. All of these operations are intended to disrupt and dismantle the enemy's ability to function as a coherent organization or respond to coalition and partner operations. And we've also seen a reduced ability, ability to maintain the tempo of propaganda that we saw early in their campaign. In August of 2015, the group released more than 700 items from their official outlets. In August of 2016, after having lost a considerable amount of territory and a year of airstrikes, that number declined to under 200 items. Of course, the advance of the Iraqi security forces on Mosul further complicates the enemy's ability to command and control its fighters. Daesh fighters have fought hard, but continue to lose ground against advancing Iraqi and Kurdish security forces. As many of you know, some Iraqi forces have reached Mosul and others continue advancing toward the city, making steady progress as Daesh are forced to fall back. The ISF are conducting their advance deliberately as Daesh continue their tactics to intimidate civilians and complicate the Iraqi advance. The, uh, to assist the ISF and KSF, the coalition has conducted a relentless campaign of precision air artillery and rocket strikes, more than 3,000 since the operation to liberate Mosul started on October 17th. With the government of Iraq, we've been planning for the liberation of Mosul for a long time. We'll continue to use precision as we support the Iraqi operations to liberate the city, not just in our use of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, but also in our procedures for coordinating strikes and our selection of munitions. Again, the government of Iraq has been clear that the protection of civilian life is a fundamental principle of their operations, and we'll offer our very best efforts to support that same principle. A word about our logistical support in Iraq. The coalition continues de delivering equipment, vehicles, ammunition, and food to support the ISF and KSF advances. 
To give you some data uh, on these efforts, the coalitions provided 279 Humvees, 84 MRAPs, 31 bulldozers, plus ambulances, bridging material, and, and obstacle breaching equipment. We believe all these things will help provide a decisive advantage to our partners as the tougher phases of the battle ensue. And with that, let's open it up for questions. Sure, we'll start with uh, Lita Valdor from the Associated Press. Hi, John. Um, a a follow-up on your comments on, um, on Iraq, uh, and then I have a, a quick Mosul question. You said that there's um, a, quite a bit has been done to isolate Raqqa. Can you give us a little bit more granularity on how isolated are we talking about? Has Raqqa, ha have there been efforts to encircle Raqqa? Has that begun? And how much of the city would you consider um, has been either isolated or encircled? And then uh, just a, a quick one on, on Mosul. Can you t tell us a little bit about um, these efforts by um, the Islamic State to you to collect and use human shields. Um, w w there's a lot of reports about them doing that. I'm wondering if you've been able to gather any data or any numbers of, of where and how much that's happening. Yep. Now, with regard to Raqqa, we'll start there. Um, the enemy still has freedom of movement into and out of Raqqa. Now, it's, uh, it's as it's been for many months. They don't have the ability to move large uh, troop formations, large convoys, uh, but they do have the ability to move into and out of the area. What we've done to try to limit that is we've conducted a lot of strikes on their favored uh, supply routes and infiltration routes. So we've done more than 100 strikes on that. We're talking about roads. Um, you know, in order to limit their freedom of movement, make it take longer for them to move and uh, move around the battlefield. So that's, uh, that's one of the tangible things that's been done. Now, uh, there is a degree of isolation uh, and pressure that's put on Raqqa on the, all the operations that I just described. So one of the things that I, I think it's very important for people to understand is uh, all that work that's been done up around the northern border uh, between Turkey and Syria, all of that isolates Raqqa because it limits their ability to resupply. It limits their ability to bring in fighters and equipment. It limits their ability uh, to get out and conduct external operations in Europe and other places around the world. So um, if I were to characterize it, I would say uh, still freedom of movement, uh, not uh, fully isolated by any means and not encircled. Um, but that's what's coming in the, in the, uh, in the near future. Oh. We've lost sound. We have seen and heard the same reports as you've had. Um, there have been uh, many reports uh, of Daesh trying to gather civilians and push them closer to the city for use as human shields. We've also seen a lot of reports of executions uh, of people that are in these areas that are around Mosul, uh, people that they believe might be uh, plotting uh, to do attacks inside the city against Daesh, sort of an internal uprising situation. So we've seen and we've heard those types of reports as well. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Else. Go back to uh, Barbara Starr in the back of CNN. Hey, Colonel Dorian, um, can you go back on a couple of points you were making? You had mentioned um, some things had happened that you felt decimated Baghdadi Shura. Can you talk about, now that we have this latest recording overnight, which appears uh, to be his voice for the first time in many months, what is the assessment about his state of command of his forces, his role right now, how isolated he may or may not be, what it says that he can get uh, communication uh, even out the door. What do you assess about Baghdadi? And my follow-up other quick, quick question on Mosul, now that Iraqi troops have entered the eastern edge of the city, 
can you bring us up to date on any indication you have that U.S. military advisors will be entering with them? Okay, well, we'll start with Baghdadi. Um, as far as that audio tape is concerned, uh, the, the audio release, uh, we cannot at this time verify its authenticity. There's probably an intelligence community expert that would be a better resource for that than I. Uh, but it is quite clearly an effort on the part of Daesh to communicate to their fighters. And this is probably excellent evidence that their command and control and ability to communicate directly with their fighters and control them uh, has been severely reduced. So uh, there are um, some uh, uh, indications uh, inside Mosul that there are people that are uh, abandoning their posts or trying to get away. We have seen reports uh, that Daesh have executed people who do that um, and that you know, one of the interesting things that we've seen in this English translation of this is that Baghdadi is saying, uh, don't fight amongst yourselves. This is the type of thing that a leader who's losing command and control and ability to keep everybody on the same page says. Um, we don't believe that it's going to work. Uh, we don't know, again, we don't know if it's him, uh, but you know, Daesh have a, a long track record, uh, you know, more than a year. They've been going backwards, losing territory. They've had uh, a number of fighters very near to Baghdadi that have been killed in targeted strikes. Not just uh, his number two, that I think that's probably the least popular job in the world because your shelf life is not going to be very long as his number two, but uh, people that are responsible for creating their propaganda. Um, their, their network is just much less effective than it's been, uh, you know, prior to uh, the Iraqi advance and the coalition involvement here in Iraq and, and then in Syria. Um, let's see, and back to Mosul. Barb, I'm sorry, I, I, I just wrote Mosul. What's, what's the rest of your question on that? That's okay. Um, um, do, can you tell us anything now that Iraqi troops have entered eastern Mosul, the most eastern edges of the city, uh, what is the current state of whether or not U.S. troops will join them in entering Mosul? Will U.S. advisors go into Mosul with them? And as long as I have you back on Baghdadi, just have to ask, any idea where he is? Well, we'll take the, uh, the Baghdadi piece off the table. If we knew where he was, he would be killed at once. Um, so we don't know where he is. Um, as far as uh, U.S. forces or coalition forces going into Mosul, we're executing the Iraqi plan, and the Iraqi plan is that the only ones going in there right now uh, are Iraqi forces. So that's the Army, that's the CTS, and that's the police. Um, as far as I know, um, I, I have not seen any uh, change in the plan uh, with that. Um, I have been doing public affairs for a very long time and I don't like to use the word never. So I don't, I won't say that, but I, I do know that right now where we're at, there is no plan for uh, coalition forces to go in there. Uh, and the Iraqis have said it's just going to be their forces. Great. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Kasim Aleri with Anadolu. Governor, thanks for doing this. There are reports coming out of Turkey right now claiming that uh, Turkey and U.S. Have, uh, are establishing a joint task force to facilitate uh, withdrawal of YPG forces from Membic. Could you confirm that? I, I'm afraid I can't. Uh, I've not seen those reports, and, and I'm not up to speed on it up. I would ask you to follow that up with my, uh, my colleagues in the Pentagon there. And the other question uh, on isolation of Raqqa. We know that the U.S. is intending to use SDF forces to encircle, to, to, to isolate the city from the north. But what about the southern flank of uh, Raqqa city? Who, who do, you, do you think to use to isolate, to encircle the city with, uh, from the south?
Mm-hmm. Were there significant numbers of um, Arab forces uh, in that area as well? And we, we intend to train as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, we'll continue to work with our partners in Syria uh, and to continue to enlarge that force and create enough uh, that we'll be able to to uh, have that force encircle uh, encircle Raqqa. So that that's uh, that is the plan at this point. Um, right now, I don't think uh, that uh, all the forces that will be involved uh, in that uh, liberation campaign for Raqqa are yet trained. Uh, but that will be a part of the effort, as will ongoing diplomatic discussions with our allies and our partners and coalition members to make sure that uh, we get everybody on the same page and, and uh, isolate Raqqa and then move in at a time uh, of our partners' choosing. Um, next we'll go to uh, Tara Kopp with Stars and Stripes. Hi, Colonel Dorian. Um, good to see you again. So. With Mosul, the western flank of the city appears to still be open. Are you still are you seeing freedom of movement of ISIS fighters out of Mosul from the west? And if so, are they able to freely move to Raqqa? Are you seeing that at all? Uh, Daesh has uh, very limited freedom of movement. They don't have the ability to move in large columns. Uh, I don't think that I would characterize them as having freedom of movement uh, to the West uh, at all. Um, so uh, we're, we're not seeing significant numbers of Daesh leaving the city or going in for that matter. I've been asked that before. So um, we'll have to just let that play out. Uh, my understanding is that the uh, government of Iraq has uh, a plan for, for dealing with uh, Western uh, Mosul. and. Um, yeah, we're, we're certainly not going to facilitate the exit for Daesh, if that's the question. Okay, and just, are you seeing any uh, additional ISIS fighters moving into Raqqa as Mosul is more sealed off? Pretty limited numbers, uh, Tara. They're, they're, uh, there, we don't see a lot of that. Um, you know, really uh, throughout northern Syria, uh, Daesh is on the back foot. Uh, they're on the back foot coming from the north against Turkey uh, and their partnered force. Uh, and they'll, they'll, uh, they're going to stay on the back, for, uh, back foot because uh, ultimately we're going to move in uh, with our partner forces and the, the noose will start to close on Mosul or on uh, Raqqa as well. One of the elements here, and I tried to capture that in the uh, opening comments, is that it's in uh, the coalition forces and, and uh, our partnered forces' interests to pressure Daesh across every formation in every area where they have a presence. So there's an ongoing operation uh, to liberate Mosul. The Iraqis are largely on plan. Uh, they're able to advance on every axis. They've uh, really taken it to Daesh, although Daesh continues to fight hard, uh, it would be a desirable situation to pressure them uh, by having concurrent operations to isolate and then liberate Mosul because they just would not have the ability to control all that. Again, you know, you see this announcement today. It's an effort to rally the troops who are under constant pressure who have been pushed back and pushed out of the areas that they used to control, that are no longer able to make as much money from illicit sales of uh, oil, no longer able to tax uh, the residents that are around them in as many areas. So they're under pressure all the time and subject to being struck anywhere that where they mass. So, um, you know, it uh, it's a it's a, a developing situation for our partners uh, in Raqqa. Uh, and, you know, I think what, what you'll see is that uh, they'll start to move on Raqqa here very soon. Okay, now next we'll go to Joe Tabbitt with Al Hara. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Dorian, uh, could you give us an update on the current status of Talafar? Uh, are you concerned? if the PMF 
takes over the supply route, route to Mosul, this could trigger or could lead to a Turkish intervention to protect the Sunni Turkmen in the city? Well, um, I understand that the popular mobilization forces are moving in the direction of Telepar. Uh, I also understand that this is a part of the government of Iraq's plan. Uh, and Prime Minister Abadi has been very clear uh, that he uh, doesn't want any human rights abuses or, or any types of abuses, uh, and uh, that he's going to hold people accountable if he sees those sorts of things. The, the forces that are moving in the, that direction have acknowledged that and said that they would operate within the parameters that they've been given. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where this is at this point. The plan is being executed in accordance with what the government of Iraq uh, planned, and uh, that's where this is headed. Just quick quick follow-up. Given what you said, I mean, are you concerned about Turkey, Turkey's position in regards to the presence of the PMF in Talafar? We... We have seen the, the, the comments coming out of Turkey. We understand their position. They, uh, they uh, want to make sure that the, uh, the Turkmen who live in that area are, are uh, not subject to any types of abuses. We, we do understand that. And, um, you know, so um, right now we don't see any indicator that uh, there is any situation like that developing. The government of Iraq understands that. They understand that uh, the world is watching what happens as uh, the, the uh, popular mobilization forces move into position. So this will be an opportunity to uh, execute that operation, that, which is consistent with their plan, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, next, we'll go to David Martin with CBS. <coughs> John, would you uh, distinguish between the isolation and the liberation of Raqqa, and specifically, will the same forces that are involved in the isolation be involved in the liberation? Mm -hmm. David, the, uh, the isolation and the liberation probably have one thing in common. There will probably be some very tough fighting to do either. There will be tough fighting to do both. Uh, as far as who will actually move into the city, I think what we're going to see is that the isolation will occur first. There will be some ongoing dialogue uh, between our partners, our allies, and the coalition about who's actually going to go in. Um, I know that there's been discussion about that being a, a force that's primarily uh, Arabs that are local, and there's a good, um, there's a good model for that. Uh, the, uh, the Arab forces that still uh, control Menbij. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that plays out. I think there will be some ongoing political dialogue, many levels above me, uh, about who actually goes in. But uh, I think we can probably uh, get the isolation on Raqqa uh, and sort of encircle it much more before uh, and set conditions for the liberation uh, while those diplomatic efforts and, and uh, planning and coordination occur and training of additional forces occur uh, for the liberation part. You said that the, uh, some of the Arab forces who would be involved uh, have not yet uh, had training. How long is the training going to take? Is there a, a, uh, a specific uh, one-week, four-week program that they go through? Mm -hmm. yeah, David, I, I, uh, I'm familiar with some of the, some of the uh, training that's been conducted in, in the past. Uh, I've seen that we've had uh, 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 periods of instruction that are ballpark two weeks, um, and these are uh, two weeks of training for people that have already been involved in some fighting before, so they're not just a bunch of rookies. Uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let that play out. 
uh, and we'll see how, how long that takes, and we'll see how many forces will be generated. I know General Townsend, when he's discussed this, uh, what he said is that the forces that are on the ground there, the SDF, do have some experience in recruiting a good force, uh, and they have, uh, you know, some plans to uh, try to open the aperture and, and uh, enlarge the Arab uh, contingent of their force. Estimates on how many more need to be trained? I don't, I wouldn't hazard a guess. Uh, I think that'll be up to our partner force. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Richard Sisk with Military.com. Hi, Colonel. Uh, there have been some reports that uh, U.S. advisors moving with the counter-terror service units on the outskirts of Mosul have been seen, spotted, possibly photographed, uh, wearing uh, the black uniforms of the CTS. Is that so, and what is the policy on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not familiar with, uh, with the, either those reports or if, the, if you've seen an image. I, I've not seen that. Uh, I think we'll have to take that one for you, and uh, I'll look into it. Sir, what is the what is the policy? Are, are U.S. troops allowed to wear the um, wear the uniform, the garb of uh, partner units that they're working with? There was the flap a few months ago about uh, some uh, special forces uh, troops uh, in Syria uh, wearing the uh, the patches of the YPG. Uh, so, what is the policy uh, for the troops now advising partnering with the Iraqis around Mosul? You know what, Richard, I'm, I'm just going to have to take that one. I'm not an expert on what the rules are for uniform wear. Uh, I, I had to get a good consult to make sure that I was wearing this one correctly. Cause, <laughs> so I'll, I'll have to take that one. I, I'm sorry, but uh, just not the expert. We'll have to make sure we get you an answer on that. Uh, next to Gordon Lubold with Wall Street Journal. Hey, Colonel, it's Gordon. Um, two questions on Mosul. Uh, and sorry if I missed it. Can you just characterize where exactly Iraqi forces are with regard to the city? Because I, I guess I'm not clear if they're kind of still on the doorstep inside the outer parts of the city or where. You may have said it and I missed it. But also, um, you know, there was a report about restoring cell service to residents inside Mosul. Uh, turn the, the switch back on, but uh, part of the idea was to see what kind of intel would, could be gleaned from residents phoning uh, in information. I just wondered if you could update us on that and if you, uh, if the Iraqi forces and U.S. forces have gotten anything out of that. Yep. Um, Gordon, I'm going to have to be a little bit careful for reasons of operational security with regard to talking about where uh, specifically troops are. And then there's also just the kind of uh, gooey matter of, you know, when do you reach Houston? Um, I, you know, the, I think if you ask 10 people around Houston, they would tell you they're Houston residents, and there would be people that tell you some suburb, too. And so I, it's almost kind of a, a difficult one to, to firm up. Um, now, uh, the... the uh, on the western, or excuse me, the eastern axis of the city, uh, my understanding is uh, they're they're right at, uh, you know, the uh, the entrance in sort of some industrial areas. Uh, I've seen those in open source reports, and I've seen the the uh, uh, counterterrorism service uh, you know, make those statements. But I really don't want to get into the business of uh, sort of a street by street discussion of where those forces are. It just wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that. Um, just wouldn't be appropriate. So uh, I hope you understand. Okay. Uh, that one with regard to the status of that effort, uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, uh, with that program. I know that there have been efforts to communicate with people inside the city. 
Uh, I can certainly acknowledge that piece. Uh, there have been radio broadcasts into the city to give instructions to people that live there. There have been substantial efforts to drop leaflets and give instructions and let people know that uh, they are going to be liberated. I also know it's a very dangerous situation for people that are in the city because uh, Dash, I've seen plenty of reports of Dash executing people that they think are collaborators. Uh, and I don't want to uh, further endanger somebody that would be helping out with useful intelligence. I don't know your name. Uh, Lori Milroy, Kurdistan 24. My question for Colonel Dorian, regarding Raqqa and the difficulties with Turkey and the YPG, are we to understand from what you've said that regarding the, the phase of the isolation of Raqqa, those difficulties have been worked, have been cleared up enough so that you can proceed with the isolation of Raqqa, but there are still issues remaining regarding the liberation of Raqqa? Well, I, 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 uh, I'm not in those conversations, and I'm not a part of the uh, diplomatic effort. I know that, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense and General Town Townsend have both been clear that we're working with our partnered forces. They've proven that they can uh, help with the isolation of Raqqa on a timeline that uh, reduces the ability of uh, the, the uh, terrorists that are there to uh, conduct external operations and that we need to go ahead and start that isolation effort. As far as what the diplomatic discussions are, I just don't have that level of fidelity to share. Hey, J.D., okay, I'm sorry, because I know we keep asking about this, but I, I just want to make sure I understand this Raqqa thing. So when you were talking earlier to David's question, when you were talking about the isolation, you said that there's an ongoing dialogue about who's going to be conducting that, right? Were you talking about the dialogue is ongoing about who's doing the isolation phase or who's doing the liberation phase? And just to be clear, the liberation phase is what's also sometimes called the assault or the maneuver phase, right? Like that's the, like essentially what they're doing right now in Mosul is the liberation phase. Yep. Uh, you've got it exactly right, Courtney. So. The ongoing dialogue is about who will liberate the city. So there may be a role for a variety of forces there. Um, all the options are on the table. Uh, where we're at now is that the isolation phase, uh, the plan is to work with our partnered force. They've proven that they've been very effective, uh, and they've proven that they can defeat Daesh so, because they did that in Mandich, and they've done it really all uh, throughout their area need to be trained. Are they all for the liberation? Are there any that are for the isolation phase that still need to be trained? What, there are adequate forces to do the isolation now. And how many forces is that? Uh, ballpark somewhere between 30 and 40,000. And, and, um, and just to be clear, the isolation phase has not yet begun, right? You're still in the shaping phase, is that right? Well, you know, th that's, uh, that's probably a little bit on the gooier side, Courtney. I, I would, I would uh, suggest to you that uh, the, the operations that have been conducted up till now have isolated Raqqa somewhat. Um, what, what I think we're talking about is a, a higher level of isolation that greatly reduces the freedom of movement of Daesh to go into and come out of that city. So. Uh, there's already been a significant amount of pressure put on them, uh, you know, whether, whether that can, you know, whether you would characterize that as isolation, that's probably something that reasonable people could uh, agree or disagree on. Um, I think the intent, though, is to intensify that effort to move closer to the city, to envelop the city, and then once uh, everything is in place, uh, to liberate it. 
use the military spelling of the word gooey since you've used it twice now? <laughs> just for quoting purposes? I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, Thank you. Laurent, I had you on the list next. Laurent Bartholomew with uh, Jean France Press. Hi, Colonel. Um, still about Raqqa. Um, do you think that the, the Syrian Democratic Forces will start to gain ground, to gain new ground uh, in the next few weeks? Um, I, I would characterize it as soon. And uh, I think that would be for them to, to announce when, uh, when they're going to start. And I'd really like to leave it at that level because, you know, they're the ones that would be moving uh, and they would be the ones that would be fighting. Uh, we'll be there to support them with our strikes and then our, you know, our advice and assistance. Uh, but w I think that's an announcement for them to make. And uh, as far as their timing, it'll be their timeline and not our timeline. Okay. Um Next to uh, Christina Wong with The Hill. Thank you. Um, um, hi, Colonel Dorian. I um, wanted to follow up on the, um, the uh, on Raqqa. Uh, what, about what percentage of the uh, 10,000 um, force sack is ready to liberate Raqqa? I, I, you sort of broke up there a little bit. Were you saying what percentage of the force is lib ready to liberate Raqqa? Syrian Arab coalition, which I understand is about 10,000. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's ballpark correct. It's, uh, it's about a third of the SDF. Um, I think that, that force uh, is trained and ready to go. Um, one of the things that we hope to do is to increase the training pipeline and create more local uh, Arab forces. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that's being worked now. Uh, that doesn't stop you from moving into position and isolating the city. Are they ready to liberate Raqqa or just isolate? <clears throat> Not, not alone. Um, and uh, on something, on um, on another uh, issue, um, do you do you anticipate an increase of air operations um, with the isolation of Raqqa? And do you think does that increase the need to communicate with um, the Russians, or are the Russians not really flying over Raqqa? I think I would, uh, I would have to take that one in order to get you a, a, an answer with any depth. I will tell you, though, that we do continue uh, our coordination channel our, uh, uh, in deconflicting uh, our operations with the Russians. We would continue to do that, uh, certainly. As far as the number of operations that would be required to support partner forces in Syria, um, that sort of remains to be seen. We'll see what plan comes together, you know, in the in the uh, weeks ahead here, and then uh, we'll probably get more meat on the bone with regard to uh, having some depth on on what uh, the requirements from the air would be. Real quick, uh, where do things stand with the Russians now after the last near miss uh, incident on October 17th? Have any steps been taken? Um, to further deconflict uh, the airspace over Syria? Uh, we continue to use the deconfliction channel that, uh, that is in place. Um, I think that it would be good for you to follow up uh, with the team at, at uh, OSDPA uh, after this because my understanding is there were some senior level discussions but uh, that is a, a newer thing that uh, I'm really not privy to any of the details on. So I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, happened, you know, here in the last day or two. Uh, next to Thomas Watkins with the Johnson Press. Hello, Colonel. Um, 
I, I missed the very beginning of the briefing, so I'm sorry if you already addressed this, but um, can you help me? I'm a bit confused uh, with the, the timing of the Raqqa stuff. Um, so last week, um, Secretary Carter said it would begin the assault. I'm not talking about shaping or isolation or softening operations. He said the assault itself would begin within weeks. Uh, what you just said about the Arab forces still needing training, that would suggest that that within weeks timetable would be offset by at least, I think you said, two to four weeks. So we're already in the month's um, arena. Could you, could you just clarify when, the, when you anticipate, uh, I'm not talking about the isolation stuff, when you anticipate the actual assault uh, beginning? Thank you. Yep. I don't know that I'm going to be able to provide you a tremendous amount of clarity on that, just in the interest of operational security. General Townsend has said uh, soon, uh, and one of the things that I, I think might be at play here is that uh, both the uh, further isolation and the assault on Raqqa uh, probably uh, entail a significant amount of very tough fighting it could be that we're basically talking about the same thing here and it's more of a semantic discussion that, that's at play here. I think that might be uh, where we're at. Do you think that uh, the Secretary misspoke when he said weeks? No. Finally, um, how, big of a, how big of a constraining factor is this as yet undone training in terms of time limitations? Yep. Uh, I, um, well, that remains to be seen because uh, the work has to start to recruit a force and then train it. Uh, the period of instruction is not really a very long period of instruction, but a lot of the fighters that get involved in this type of uh, activity are not a bunch of rookies. They're people that have done some of this ty type of fighting uh, before to protect their own villages and their own areas. So um, I, I don't think that I can give you uh, great detail on the timing, but I do know there is an intent to enlarge the force, and in particular, the Arab contingent of the force, because we do understand that Raqqa is primarily a, uh, an Arab city, and just like we have, uh, just like the Iraqis have done in, in Mosul, um, we do understand that there's a political dimension and a, a local uh, acceptance dimension to this fight, and we want to make sure that uh, the right forces are going in there. And then we want to set diplomatic conditions so that uh, they, they will be successful and be able to go in there and fight Dash unconstrained. Next we'll go to Lucas Tomlinson with Fox News. Colonel, can you talk about the importance of U.S. and coalition airstrikes in the Mosul operation? Well, the, uh, the coalition airstrikes have set conditions really where Daesh's command and control have been severely disrupted. Uh, and that's really been very impactful as, as uh, far as the ability uh, of uh, uh, the Iraqi security forces and the Peshmerga and the CTS to move forward. They're very tough fighters. They've planned for quite some time. But one of the things that we've tried very much to do is to uh, time our strikes so that they're out in front of these forces as they're moving forward. Not only does that disrupt the enemy, uh, but it also gives a lot of confidence to forces that already had tremendous momentum as they, you know, moved into this fight. So uh, for months before Mosul, we were disrupting Dash's ability to make money from illicit oil sales, and that means that every fighter in that area gets a nice pay cut. Um, we were going against uh, Daesh uh, leaders uh, and took out a very significant number of them. We've, we've talked about that a number of times over the past several weeks. That disrupts their command and control and ability to respond as the, the uh, Iraqi security forces advance toward them. Uh, 
uh, they still have some ability to do that. Uh, but it's significantly disrupted, and timing is everything, and that's one of the reasons why uh, it was very important to the government of Iraq to move forward and capitalize on all the work that's been done from that disruption. Um, and then since the campaign started, we've dropped more than 3,000 munitions on dash targets. So we're talking about uh, a couple of hundred fighting positions. We're talking about a hun you know, hundreds of fighters. Uh, we're talking about um, scores of vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. We're talking about scores of tunnels that DASH used to create freedom of movement in localized areas. So all those obstacles have been reduced. They haven't all been taken away because it would be virtually impossible to do that with DASH having been in this area for two years with chances to build these elaborate defenses. But there's no question that it's very impactful, and, um, and, and it makes a big difference. So we're very proud of that work. Do some of the forward air controllers, the, some of these U.S. forces that are forward with the Iraqi forces and Peshmerga, are they playing a big role in these airstrikes as well? The overwhelming preponderance of the forward air control uh, activity is done from our strike cells uh, far from the front. Uh, so really, um, you know, uh, forward air controllers are effective anywhere that you put them, but the overwhelming preponderance of these strikes are coordinated through our strike cells. Now these are areas that are uh, well away from the front. We, uh, we have one here in Baghdad. Uh, that's involved in a, a lot of the ongoing activity here. So um, this is uh, people using ISR platforms. They're uh, getting pattern of life. They're examining these targets. They're coordinating with the Iraqis. Uh, and then making decisions about what types of munitions should be used. So we recognize, for example, that when you're fighting in dense urban terrain, uh, maybe smaller bombs are better. Um, so we're trying to make those kinds of calculated decisions so that we uh, advance the same goals as the government of Iraq, which is can we do this and do everything that we can uh, to limit uh, collateral damage and reduce the possibility of loss of life for the civilians that are affected by this. And lastly, Colonel, have the popular mobilization forces succeeded in cutting off the road between Talafar and Mosul? And how popular are these forces with the U.S. military? And does it bother you that some of these forces are designated terrorists by the U.S. State Department? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as how, how successful they've been in, uh, in cutting off roads, I think I'd have to check that, and uh, I'm, I'm not even sure that I could get total fidelity on that. Uh, what I would say is some of the, uh, some of the, the reporting uh, on these popular mo mobilization forces doesn't have as much depth as we would like to see. Uh, we do understand that they've played a role in, uh, you know, responding uh, to when Dash was on the advance. Um, not all of them are uh, involved in human rights abuses. Some of them are working very closely with the government of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and so, you know, we, we absolutely understand that, uh, you know, these groups that uh, have been involved in acts of terror uh, and human rights abuses, we just obviously we're not going to help them. That's a, the law, for one, uh, but, um, you know, a lot of these other groups uh, are working hand in hand with the government of Iraq to execute the government of Iraq's plan. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Jim Michaels with uh, USA Today. Colonel, does, uh, regarding Raqqa, does the FDF uh, currently have a command hierarchy capable of uh, planning and operation of the complexity of Raqqa and also then the ability to command forces on the ground 
uh, once the liberation phase uh, begins? Or, and is the coalition working to develop those capabilities within the SDF now? Well, we advise and assist uh, the SDF, our partner force. Uh, we do believe that they have uh, the expertise. They, they were very successful in developing a plan for the liberation of uh, Mambidge. And we believe that uh, certainly with coalition help, they can do the same in Raqqa. So um, we do believe that they have the capability to do this. And that's one of the reasons why uh, General Townsend has said and the Secretary has said that uh, you know we'll, we will move forward soon with that force. Uh, next to Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hey John, uh, quick question about the uh, the offensive, the Iraqi Security Force offensive out of Kiara. Um, that seems directed to go up along the west bank of the Tigris towards Mosul. Why is that one progressing much slower than the eastward offenses on the other side of the, of the Tigris? Yeah. You know what, Louis, I think I'd probably have to refer you to the government of Iraq as far as their progress. I would say that uh, these types of operations have their own pace. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when, you, uh, when you're up against a tough enemy, it, it may be a, a variety of factors. It has to do with uh, the aggressiveness of the advancing force. It has to do with uh, the toughness and the amount of distance covered. Uh, I think the uh, the southern advance was a much uh, further distance away from the city at the start. Um, there are a variety of reasons, and um, you know nobody ever said uh, as we began this and as the Iraqis began this that everybody would show up at exactly the same time. So the Iraqis uh, have been very pleased with their progress. I've talked to them. Um, they've made substantial progress on every axis. Um, so uh, they're on plan. Uh, Jeff Sullivan, Voice of America. Colonel, thank you very much. Wondering, I know you said there's not a lot of movement to the west of Mosul with uh, Islamic State fighters going in or out of the city, but given all the area between Mosul and Raqqa, can you characterize in any way just how strong the Islamic State fighting force presence is in that area, whether you have numbers or, or just a sense of of how difficult the fight would be in those areas outside of the cities. And also, even though there hasn't been as many civilians fleeing Mosul so far as some of the aid groups has, have anticipated, is there any sense of within those that have, how many Islamic State fighters have tried to sneak out with them? I know that uh, at some of the uh, IDP camps, they've been doing some of the screening already in, in that a number of people have been taken away. Do you have any, uh, any sense of how many of those are, are actually ISIS? Well, first to the, to the west of, uh, of Mosul. Uh, a lot of that area out there is just desert. Um, so, you know, it'd be very difficult uh, for me to do an estimate of exactly how many are out there. It's a, sort of an unforgiving area. Uh, there's not, not that much out there. Now, there is a substantial Daesh presence in Tel Afar, um, and, you know, we expect to see some tough fighting there uh, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead. Um, as far as, uh, let's see, um, the number of, uh, of uh, IDPs that are coming out of Mosul, I think we're still very early uh, in the campaign very early. And so uh, we don't want to, you know, get ahead of ourselves and, and, and suggest that there won't be a lot. Um, you know, I, I saw some numbers uh, the other day that it was ballpark 21,000. That may be evolving, and we may see that grow much larger in the days ahead. Uh, the Iraqis that have been planning for this for quite some time. And they do have procedures in place, and they do plan to make sure that it's uh, forces that are under the government's command and control that are doing the screening of the IDPs um, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that's done in an appropriate fashion. Daesh has, 
pretty much done everything that they can to make things more dangerous, and the Iraqis uh, are going into that effort, uh, that screening effort, uh, understanding that they are almost certain to see Daesh fighters try to infiltrate uh, the, the internally displaced persons. So they're going to be very careful about this and very deliberate about it, and really everything about the campaign uh, I think is going to move at a pace uh, that allows the Iraqi security forces to try and protect civilian life and protect themselves from an enemy that's shown at every turn that they don't care about the civilians that are around them and they're willing to do horrible, horrible things uh, in order to inflict damage on civilians and certainly the Iraqi security forces. So a uh, very dangerous situation. It's one that's very complicated for the Iraqis. Uh, but they are ready for this, and they do uh, know that they know what they're doing. The Islamic State fighters have been captured so far, trying to sneak out with the IDPs? I, I'm afraid I don't. I, I don't know if that would be available. We'll take that question and see. I think that might be one that we just have to refer you to the Iraqis. Uh, to see what uh, what they say. Okay, uh, Kassam, I believe you had a follow up. Yeah. Uh, uh, about this thirty to forty thousand number, uh, Colonel. Uh, you know, what other groups are also included in this number? Because we know that the the the, the number does not apply just to SDF. Yeah, that, that includes the Syrian Arab Coalition, too. Yeah, Syrian Arab Coalition is already under the umbrella of <laughs> SDF, right? Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, we're about out of time, but go ahead fast. Yeah. Also, you know, what is the incentive for a group to take part in isolation uh, process isolation of Raqqa city, but not allowed to get in or the whole territory out of it. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, that uh, what we're trying to do is facilitate the defeat of Daesh, uh, and Daesh has uh, driven millions of people from their homes, killed tens of thousands. Uh, some in the most horrible possible way. So if you have an opportunity to contribute to their defeat and demise, uh, I think that there are going to be people that are interested in doing that. And with that, J.D., thank you uh, very much for your time. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much, Jeff.